All right, so welcome to this session on the DHS2 Design Lab, where we will talk about uh, challenges and opportunities related to uh, user-oriented design and innovation uh, in and around the DHS2 ecosystem. Uh, my name is Magnus Lee. I'm a PhD researcher uh, at the University of Oslo uh, and have been working with HISP and DHS2 for six years or something now, mainly related to research. So yeah, understanding what is going on and, and, and connecting that to issues and concern in the uh, field of information systems research. Yes, uh, please, if you have any questions along the way, you can ask them in the uh, chat. Uh, there is also this thread on the community of practice uh, where it's also possible to air any experiences or uh, whatever. So in this session, I will first talk a bit about uh, focus that we have in the lab around user-oriented design and innovation. Uh, then I will specifically uh, talk a bit about the three conditions uh, that uh, kind of affects the, the ability to, uh, to um, design and innovate when DHS2 is implemented in implementation projects. Uh, I will say a bit about some of the projects that we're working with. Among some things, we're developing some resources to support more innovation. Uh, and then a few points about the future. So the kind of basis for what we're doing in the lab is that the HS2 is becoming, uh, as you know, and uh, which is evident in this, in this annual conference, that the HS2 is becoming increasingly flexible. Uh, to be implemented in very different types of use cases across different user organizations. Uh, and all of these typically would have uh, some similar needs and some very different needs. Um, and this is kind of both a challenge and an opportunity uh, because first of all, it's, it's difficult to make one kind of generic software solution that works perfect across a kind of extremely diverse and heterogeneous uh, user group. So it's it's difficult, increasingly difficult, of course, to develop kind of a one size fits all solution on the on the generic level of design. Uh, also, uh, as the solution is becoming more flexible, which is one way of, of, of course, addressing this kind of diversity, uh, the implementation process also is kind of increasingly complex or complicated, uh, requiring a lot of competence both kind of technical competence in terms of how you configure DHS2, all the different possibilities and opportunities that lies within the uh, configurability and also the increasing focus on extendability, the ability to develop apps on top of DHS2 to address you know, specific needs, uh, but also more kind of social organizational capacity, such as how you manage quite big projects since uh, implementation projects are flexible and you can do a lot of things, then it turns into kind of a real software engineering project with, with, uh, which has to be governed and, and, and negotiated and, and driven. Uh, and of course, also increasing need of you know, user domain knowledge in all these different domains. Um, but so, so those are challenges, but on the other hand, the DHS2 is, is kind of turning into an infrastructure for uh, what we call implementation level design and innovation. Uh, so with the increased flexibility, all these apps that exist, both developed by the core team and, 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 and uh, third parties in the ecosystem, uh, it's, it's uh, starting to become kind of a, a real infrastructure where you can do a lot of interesting innovations on top of it. And thus, there is a great potential for, for doing more user-oriented design and innovation, uh, meaning to build kind of useful tools for, for the needs of different end users uh, based on kind of the specific needs within different organizations. So that is, that is the, the starting point uh, kind of for, for our work. Um, so, so one way of looking at it, which is part of our work also is in comes to kind of conceptualizing what we're seeing when we are exploring these topics is that all these resources that are developed to be generic through what we call generic level design, uh, a lot by the core team, but also about from a lot of different actors, for instance, in terms of third party apps, uh, documentation, all this, 
is kind of could be seen as an infrastructure that supports the implementation processes in in specific organizations. So in ministries of health, for instance, then you can leverage all these resources and then configure and extend them uh, according to the specific needs. And again, that that provides an opportunity for more, uh, of course, focus on uh, designing useful, relevant tools for end users that are kind of novel and uh, and uh, yeah, innovative. So the way we do this in the lab is that we, we do both uh, diagnostic design and intervention oriented research. So we try to understand the current practices that, that works and what doesn't work in terms of designing and innovating in, in implementation projects. Uh, so we follow a lot of different uh, implementation projects. We have focus groups and, and so on with different uh, HISP groups and other implementation specialists. Uh, units. Uh, then we try to explore resources through design. So we design resources that are intended to support practices. And we also participate in interventions trying to introduce new things, for instance, related to app, app development, uh, you know, supporting more efficient uh, app development, for instance, or, or related to innovation methods, for instance. Yeah, so some of the projects that we have have uh, some, some kind of highlights. We have participated in a lot of projects in India, for instance, uh, or more concretely two projects in India, large projects uh, where we have explored challenges and opportunities in addressing usability. Um, we have had uh, several sessions with various HISP groups on, uh, on the practices of implementing DHS2 and, and, and Again, the challenges and opportunities with kind of focusing on end user needs in these projects. Uh, we collaborate with uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health in some projects in Rwanda where we try to do more kind of social technical innovations, as we call it. So trying to not only think in terms of technology innovations, but also in how do you kind of innovate around a social issue uh, with a with kind of toolbox of not only apps or a specific tool, but also kind of uh, practices and, and, and other or other types of interventions. Um, yeah, and we develop, uh, collaborate with the core team on developing and testing develop, uh, apps, web app development resources and so on. And the, just to kind of uh, break up here a bit, um, we are very interested in talking to more people within the DHS2 community. So people that are uh, have experiences with projects related to um, app development or projects that have been particularly challenging or successful in terms of user orientation. Um, uh, please scan this QR code and, and submit your email address because then we're very interested in talking to you. Also, if you have experience with agile software development related to DHS2 implementation, that would be uh, very useful. Yeah, so returning to, to the presentation, um, I thought I would dive a bit into some key conditions for user-oriented design innovation uh, in the HS2 implementations. Uh, and this is based on some of these initiatives that I mentioned, where we have participated in projects and, and been talking to uh, different uh, implementation experts of the HS2, trying to really understand what, what does it take to, to actually kind of uh, build an infrastructure that supports uh, design and innovation uh, of useful tools for, for, for users. Uh, and there are particularly three conditions that are, that are kind of standing out as uh, very important in these initiatives. And one is the affordable design flexibility, as we call it, the ability to actually design things, uh, you know, uh, IT features based on uh, whatever needs and and uh, and the practices that are present in the individual organizations. Um, I will return to each of these in more detail. Uh, then we have the project configuration, meaning the way projects are organized in terms of scopes and mandates and what how is the problem that the project is trying to address defined. Uh, what types of 
methods are used uh, for structuring the process. Uh, for instance, is the project kind of geared towards this more waterfall type of model versus agile uh, will greatly impact uh, kind of space for innovation and, and focus on end users in the implementation process. Uh, and then we have the implementation practices, which refers to the kind of usual way of doing things of the implementation experts that are collaborating with the user organizations. So that could be the HISP groups or or other kind of independent implementation specialist, the way they typically organize uh, their, their implementation uh, processes. So diving a bit into each of these, uh, these aspects, and also then after this, we will talk a bit about the implications and what, what we kind of work on in order to, to, to try to address these, these conditions a bit. So starting with the project configuration, which is uh, kind of an overall very interesting aspects of implementation projects, where these met typical methods for design and innovation that focus on end users, such as user-centered design, uh, participatory design, and also agile software development um, methods, they typically promote building and improving systems through these iterative design processes. So uh, not defining all requirements at the beginning and then spending two years building the system and then kind of testing it, but rather building smaller uh, prototypes and things and then iteratively evaluating the usefulness and the usability of the, the things that are being developed. So typically starting with understanding you know, the problem and the needs of users and their practices then formulating you know, problems to kind of orient the design around, then ideate and prototype and evaluate. And that goes kind of like an iterative uh, process. This is, of course, very much constrained or enabled by how the implementation project is configured. So, for instance, what types of scopes that are defined, you know, what is actually being focused on here? Is it a very, very, very specific technical detail? Is it you know a large kind of social organizational issue? What are the mandates of the implementations experts? For instance, some projects, the 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 people that are you know working with the technology, they are kind of working in silo, and then you have someone else bringing in the requirements with kind of limited uh, ability for the, uh, the 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 people building the technology to kind of interact with users their mandate might be only the technology, which could be uh, a constraining factor when actually trying to do these iterative processes. And then of course the expected outcomes of the project, if the project already is defined very kind of uh, detailed in terms of what is the output, then it's very difficult to work in this iterative, iterative manner. And within this, kind of uh, mandate scope uh, thing. Uh, especially uh, kind of particularly challenging issue is this balance between the flexibility in the project. So how flexible is the project in terms of kind of changing the expected output of the project as you know the project evolves uh, versus the pre predictability of the project. Because Obviously, all parties are interested in some uh, kind of predictability. So a user organization, for instance, let's say a Ministry of Health, they obviously, when they, um, uh, when they are procuring and, and negotiating with a HISP group or another implementation uh, specialist group, um, they, they, of course, need some kind of predictability on what is actually going to be the output from that. The project and also at the same time the the implementation specialist also needs to to have some kind of predictability to avoid scope creeps and, and you know projects getting out of hand which is a very typical challenge but then on the other hand if if the project is kind of defined at kind of a certain uh, or very specific in terms of the output from the outset then you run the risk of course that you're you're building something that will not fit in the end when you have kind of started to develop, you know, the user organization, then you might discover that there are other issues, uh, technology changes over time. Uh, you know, there are a multitude of examples of projects where you kind of define the whole project and it takes four or five years to, to really implement it. 
And then when you do that, the organization have already changed and the technology have changed. And what you're building is actually then, you know, tomorrow, uh, yesterday's uh, answer to a yesterday problem uh, type of situation. So, so this is a very interesting uh, tension. And there, interestingly also, there are uh, some his groups that are employing interesting strategies for dealing with them, this tension. Uh, so for instance, in Mozambique, they, they are working quite systematically with kind of trying to identify opportunities as the processes are, are moving. So there is a defined project and so on, but then as they identify opportunities, that could be kind of prompted either from the uh, organizational side that there is a need that have no solution yet. And then there is a potential for building an app, for instance, for that. Or also the other way around, there is certainly an app available within the DHS2 ecosystem that has a potential uh, impact within an implementation project. And then there has to be, of course, a process of kind of renegotiating the project configuration so that those, those innovations could be catered for in the project. Others are, uh, are actively working to kind of build in some sort of spaces in the implementation project so that you know requirements could be renegotiated but still keeping some form of uh, predictability uh, and also you know there is are significant differences in terms of is the project defined around organizational goals or is it defined around specific it solutions so some projects are more defined towards you know this is the organizational outcome that we want to have and then that is actually what you're measuring kind of in the end. And then there is more flexibility throughout the process to, to, to define the technology as you learn about the organizational practices and, and then iterate throughout the process. Another interesting uh, challenge, which is also well discussed in, in, in academic research is this tendency that many projects are defined as IT projects while sometimes it might have been more fruitful to define it as an organizational kind of project and this of course both affect the uh, scope and the mandate of the project so if the project is defined as an it project then there might be limited ability to change for instance practices and social aspects uh, which which might be necessary or should maybe more ideal than actually you know changing the it solutions and there are some several interesting experiences from that in some of our projects where, for instance, we have to kind of build apps which could have been avoided if we were able to rather, you know, modify some of the suboptimal ways of working, uh, but that is beyond the scope of the, uh, the project and then, you know, we, you have to deal with deal with building and maintaining a lot of kind of technology that would, you would, would possibly not need if you have had the mandate to, to work a bit broader on the on the but then on the other hand that will of course require much more kind of trust between the user organization and the and a lot of more capacity uh, in on the implementation uh, expert side if if kind of been trusted with not only designing the IT solutions but uh, but uh, the practices and the routines within within the user organizations see yeah so just a interesting uh, example um related to the project configurations so uh, one project that we have uh, worked with in the past uh, we have uh, collaborated with one his group on on uh, commodity consumption reporting uh, and trying to uh, design uh, a system that that supports on based on DHS2 that that uh, supports uh, the reporting of consumptions of, of commodities uh, within the public health system uh, and in that project uh, it has been kind of an evolution with multiple ways of framing the problem that we have been focusing on which provides some examples on you know how important this problem framing is for what you're actually looking at what you're designing and what you're seeing within a within an implementation project so the first, first problem framing that we kind of started out with in the project was how we can support health commodity reporting with the HS2. And here, of course, the technology is already kind of part of what you're uh, the defined problem. Uh, 
uh, and what it basically then resulted in, which also uh, proved to be quite useful uh, for many actors, was which uh, the kind of typical DHS2 implementation project where they have these paper-based systems, uh, which were then set up, configured into DHS2, uh, moving it from paper-based reporting to reporting in this, uh, for many of you, very familiar data entry application. Then uh, that worked quite well for many. And the data output uh, could suddenly be used, you know, in the HS2 with, with analytics and, and uh, different types of presentations, which improved kind of decision making uh, around, around the commodity consumption reporting. But one group that did not kind of uh, benefit from this transition were the people that were entering these reports. So they actually reported that, you know, the paper-based reporting system were more stable, easier to use in terms of usability because this was quite a heavy kind of screen to enter data into uh, and so on. So then we had a project on framed more around how we can make the data entry more uh, usable and relevant for the, uh, for the data entry clerks and the hospital uh, uh, store workers that usually filled out this form on a by uh, monthly basis. Uh, so then the, the framing were more kind of explicit around the usability and relevance for a specific type of user group. And of course, then also the project were designed more around, you know, specific methods for, for, for understanding the practices uh, and challenges of the users, uh, trying to, to prototype and iterate and build build something that could be uh, more usable and relevant than this uh, existing form. And then what we ended up with was this data entry kind of dashboard that showed reports and deadlines and stuff. And then we have this stepwise data entry uh, thing, which also validated numbers as you kind of filled in each row, which here you had to kind of go back and then try to identify it in the form where you had made a mistake. Uh, and that somehow increased, you know, the, the usability of the solution uh, for this data entry uh, user group. Um, however, what, when we did that project, then we also saw some interesting signs of, you know, there is a potential here for maybe doing this also even simpler. So we, we also carried out an exercise framed more around how we can better support the work of the hospital uh, medical store workers. So in, you know, in both of the formers, the tool were kind of defined in advance that, okay, we want to, to use, here we have the DHS2 thing, and we know, you know, we, have, we know that there is a data entry and that is what is going to be improved and that's going to be made more usable and relevant. But then in the, in the third problem framing, we tried to, be a bit broader and, and formulate the project more around you know how do we, how do we better support the work of the hospital medical store workers which obviously was a bit more open-ended uh, and we then ended up with with exploring different solutions around commodity dispensing so that's what we saw that you know rather than entering this by monthly report then could the instead register the uh, commodities on uh, on the dispensing, uh, which then previously did on paper uh, in these tally sheets. And then that would actually generate these reports automatically on the later point uh, or every, every other month. So the point here is that this, you know, the way you're framing the problem, the, the very type, different types of, of kind of solutions you will possibly end up with. And, Again, that have, you know, could be enabled or constrained by the, the way the projects are configured in terms of scope and mandates and the formulated problem that you kind of enter into. And I think there is a lot of potential in many of the DHS2 implementations, uh, which I think is, you know, a great, great opportunity that there are so many implementations in different countries and with the ability to develop apps and uh, and so on. It's, uh, there is a lot of interesting innovations that can happen on top of this already established, you know, the classical kind of data entry uh, regimes, such as this commodity dispensing uh, uh, module that was developed as, a, as an app. Yes. So, a bit laggy slides here. Um, 
moving to the next um, condition. So now we talked a bit about the project configuration as one important kind of uh, enabling or constraining element for designing and innovating uh, around users in implementations. Uh, a second uh, condition is these implementation practices. And with practices, I mean that the established ways of doing things. Uh, for instance, we were in uh, a HISP group or another implementation agency. Um, and here there are also big differences in how people, for instance, typically structure implementation projects. This also, of course, varies from project to project uh, related to the project configuration. Uh, where some are more uh, active in pursuing kind of an agile way of working in, in implementation projects. Uh, and some are more oriented towards the traditional waterfall model. And some are more what you maybe could call pragmatic, which is more kind of you know, doing what works best at that point in time without too much kind of uh, def definitions around it. Um, there is also you know, great differences in the both the capacity, awareness, and motivations for working with uh, user-oriented methods as part of the process. So some groups, for instance, in Mozambique, are very kind of uh, eager to promote the use of user-oriented methods. Uh, Malawi also tries to typically negotiate, you know, user-oriented design or user-centered design methods as part of kind of the project mandate structuring uh, process. Uh, while others are 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 you know trying maybe to avoid that as much as possible and rather you know uh working we closely with uh, with uh, management team project management team within the user organization but of course also depends a lot between different projects and interestingly also uh, you know the perspective on end users and why you want to work with them is is somewhat different also someone see you know the it's kind of elementary and extremely important to to see the users as someone to learn from and then try to support with technology while someone's system maybe more as someone to kind of fight with and try to convince to use something uh, that that they maybe don't want to <laughs> want to use. Um, interestingly also is this you know, software engineering maturity in different different groups also so some are more maybe cautious on you know how, how do we work in implementation projects are there any improvements we can make is it possible to you know introduce new types of techniques and methods for managing our implementation projects. Um, yeah, so there are there are some differences and a lot of interesting examples of good practices, which is some of the stuff that we want to document and, and kind of share with the broader community in the in the design lab. Uh, and to highlight two main things that we are kind of concerned with is the the of the obvious one, which is kind of the capacity and motivation for carrying out more user-oriented design and innovation activities, uh, you know, trying to build capacity of, you know, uh, contemporary methods for, for working agile and, and, and uh, close to users and kind of building these fruitful arenas for innovation. But then also, interestingly, the capacity and motivation for negotiating for also this. So one is to carry out methods, but the other uh, you know, as seen with the project configuration, there is also a lot of negotiation and, and, and you know, a lot of responsibility for organizing a good implementation project is, of course, on the uh, implementation specialist, it has to be implementation specialists. Um, uh, and then, you know, some groups are very active in negotiating for, you know, a, a fruitful arena for thinking about users and designing for them while, while Others are not that active in that element. So that's also a very interesting and important element. Let's see my slides again, a little bit laggy. Yes, so turning to the, the last of these uh, conditions. So we talked about the project configuration and implementation practices, and then the final conditions which have kind of a large impact on the implementation process is the what we call the affordable software design flexibility. Um, and with that, we refer to the, you know, the ability to actually respond to specific uh, user needs. So 
in many implementation projects, for instance, some of the ones we've been involved with in India, then uh, we, you know, we find a lot of interesting things that we could improve, but then uh, it's not possible to easily kind of configure that in the edge size too. Uh, and often also if the issues are not, you know, enormous, uh, then it's not considered viable to develop an app for it. Uh, and a key principle in this user-oriented design methods is, of course, that the needs of users should kind of inform the design and innovation of, uh, of IT solutions. Uh, so, the, and in the HS2, you have obviously this configurability that you will find in the maintenance app, and also this, this is data entry form builders and so on. Uh, which is beneficial because it's it's relatively easy, fast, and have limited maintenance costs tied to it. Uh, it's kind of automatically transferred when you're upgrading the software and so on. But then on the other hand, it's it's limited in to you know, metadata, data entry forms, and some kind of switching on and off functionality or choosing between different apps, which is of course becoming richer and richer as there are more apps developed by the community. Uh, and then the app development, that is a kind of uh, you know, monumental change in the DHS2 system that you have the ability to develop apps for, uh, in principle, any kind of need that you, you would discover. But then on the other hand, that requires software development competence. It is costly then in terms of the immediate you know, development time and, and, and uh, competence. And it is also something that then has to be maintained on that uh, individual implementation, if not kind of generified into a generic app. So one thing that we kind of find interesting is that these generic features and the uh, adaptation capabilities, the configurability and the extendability acts in many cases as some sort of a lens in the implementation projects. So if you're very experienced the edge has to uh, implementer, then of course, you know, a lot of what is possible with the edge size 2 and you would know what would be difficult in the edge size 2 because it's not part of the configurability or uh, the existing generic features. So that means that in the implementation projects, the, the generic features and the adaptation capabilities uh, have some sort of kind of a gravity that, that you know, pulls the focus towards what is readily available and leaves things that are not that readily available in the dark. Uh, and that's why I think these ap application development resources, um, um, SDKs, the app development platform, the DHS2 UI library, and so on, are, are, are very important uh, interventions into the kind of DHS2 ecosystem because it supports more affordable design flexibility. So, you know, with the app development platform, it, you know, these components, for instance, they are still maintained by uh, the core team, and then you kind of assemble them as an app, meaning that in some point in the future, you could imagine that, you know, there's only kind of the glue between the components that are maintained within the specific implementations, yet you are able to kind of, you know, combine different components and build very, very different user interfaces and new types of functionality, uh, but still with limited maintenance on the, on the level uh, of the individual organization. So kind of trying to, to, to look at what this means is that, you know, um, thinking about different kind of forms or scopes of design. So if, uh, you know, design focusing on usability, for instance, which is from form of user oriented design and user interfaces uh, will of course have some kind of demands on the project configuration. For instance, uh, you know there has to be defined that you know usability testing, uh, involvement of users in evaluation, and so on has to be part of the process. Uh, it obviously will have some an impact or demands on the implementation practices and capacity. In that you need methods and, and capacity for negotiating those into the project and and conducting or carrying out such as methods um needs to be part of the practices of the implementation experts and uh, it has some 
effects on the so uh, software design flexibility or demands on the software design flexibility and that you have to be able to shape user interfaces uh, so that they are you know, usable uh, for, for the user groups that you have. And these, these issues could be quite, you know, challenging sometimes. Uh, one project that we worked in, for instance, where they wanted to call, you know, refer to data sets, which is a common term in, in the HS2, as something else. Uh, but that is not something you can configure very easily. So that means that you have to, you know, rather than either then you have to build new apps for everything, which is costly and not a viable solution, or you have to, you know, retrain the users to, to adopt a diff different uh, type of language for what they're working on. Uh, which might be the you know, best choice in that situation, since modifying that part of the HS2 is, is very difficult. Um, if you are, you know, have user-oriented design projects focusing more on IT tools, you know, innovation of tools that are relevant to end users, that of course again puts increasing demands on project configuration and the practices and the software design flexibility. And again, here the apps, you know, the ability to develop web apps or Android apps is a great. You know, step in that direction that it's possible to extend the solution with functionality and and, uh, and user interfaces beyond what is offered in the generic solution. But again, that also is tied very much to you know the capacity and the, how projects are configured. If the project is configured with the solution up front uh, before you kind of go into the practices and needs of users, then it's then it's not. Uh, very easy to, of course, include that, those aspects as part of the process. And then you have kind of the most, you could call it the extreme form of, of user orientedness, uh, which focuses more on the social technical system. So, you know, designing IT and, and practices in kind of tandem. Uh, but then again, with even more kind of demands on the project configuration and the software design flexibility and so on. Final uh, thing I will say about these conditions before we turn into some of the uh, implications and the, the work that we're doing in uh, in the design lab is that you know these these aspects are interesting also uh, interdependent. So it means that uh, you know the way projects are configured are typically also affected by what is kind of the affordable design flexibility in the HS2. So during the initial negotiations of project configurations. Then, of course, uh, you already start typically talking about what is possible with the edge size 2. What is the design space? What are the generic features that could be you know, relevant in this project? So that the, the, the generic features and the adaptation capabilities is, of course, part of the negotiation in the beginning. And now that the edge 2 is becoming more flexible, easier to develop apps, more generic apps available from the community, then, of course, also that will have an impact on the negotiation of the projects if if done kind of correctly um, and of course also this project configuration is something that is going on typically for many years and as there are new opportunities emerging in the kind of the hs2 design infrastructure new third-party apps new features uh, provided by the core team then of course that will also have an impact and uh, potentially um, if if you know that infrastructure is monitored by implementation experts, then 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 that will lead to more uh, new opportunities. Uh, also, interestingly, of course, the project configuration affects what you can do with uh, given uh, flexibility. So, if the project is defined around here, there is no room for any application development, for instance. Then, of course, you are not able to utilize that, that app development flexibility if it's already agreed that we are only building this system using the generic features and configuring them. Similarly, you know, the way projects are configured will both be affected by the implementation practices, you know, whether, for instance, his groups or others are you know, negotiating for any user involvement and user orientations in the projects. And also the other way around, what has been agreed upon in the project configuration also affects what is possible to do uh, given the capacity and so, uh, with the implementation groups. And also, of course, the capacity to develop apps affects you know, what is considered the affordable software design flexibility that way. Uh, and the implementers are constantly, of course, affected by what is available within the uh, design infrastructure or with the, within the bounds of the HS2. So, and that's why also the, the type of work that we're doing in the lab try to kind of address 
several of these aspects because they are you know, heavily in, in the, interdependent. So if if the available software design flexibility increases, then of course also it's easier to promote you know practices focusing more on, on flexible design and also promoting negotiations of broader projects um, and vice versa. Yes, so turning from the, the these three conditions, um, I will also then in the end of my presentation talk a bit about uh, what we are working on concretely uh, around building resources to support design and innovation practices, given these conditions that I, uh, I just talked about. So one, one thing that we are working on and where we have several master students at the University of Oslo, um, both working on kind of content and uh, format, is this uh, design and innovation uh, toolkit. So the toolkit is intended to support and promote methods and techniques and experiences from different uh, related to different uh, user oriented types of way of working. Um, and it's currently a uh, kind of very early beta, but we have uh, now students working on it, for instance, this summer to, to add the content based on uh, both kind of contemporary methods and techniques and also experiences from the and the DHS2 community. Um, so here you can see a screenshot uh, also from uh, the idea is that you have activities and techniques and that you can search for, for different uh, either techniques which are kind of specific ways of doing things, for instance, interviews or observations or stakeholder mapping uh, or, you know, uh, analyzing, you know, uh, existing uh, ways, uh, systems and practices. And then we have activities which are more uh, kind of groups of things so that could for instance be prototyping and then prototyping have a lot of different techniques that you can use to prototype for instance wireframing uh, storyboards paper prototyping uh, and so on, so on uh, so the idea here is that uh, we will have different types of you know things that are relevant in in implementation projects and then that can be used in projects to find you know contemporary ways of uh, or uh, suitable which is the most important ways of for instance working with users or organizing innovation projects another activity which which is interesting is ideation for instance so what kind of techniques can help uh, someone in a design process in ideating and also analyzing for instance the challenges of specific user groups and based on that prototype solutions uh, yeah, and then you see that this is also screenshots from some of the, uh, the early version of the of the of the method toolkit, where there is a description of, for instance, how you do. A, as of now, very thin descriptions of how you do do interviews and what are important concerns in that process. Uh, and the idea also over time is that this we're trying to build this as a kind of a flexible thing where you easily can add new types of activities. So we have, for instance, a team exploring agile software development principles for implementation level design. And then the idea is to actually, you know, build guidelines, principles, techniques, processes that we can add into this toolkit. So we could have here and kind of agile software development. So what do you want to support with? And you can select agile software development. And then there will be experiences from projects, you know, common challenges, ways to overcome them, uh, principles, again, techniques that can help in different phases of an agile software development project. Uh, and also similarly, for instance, we have one activity which we should call an open innovation project, which just kind of starts with an open-ended problem area, and then you kind of iterate to innovate uh, through prototyping, evaluation, and so on. And then there are different techniques tied to those different activities. Uh, and the hope is then that we can work closer also with, with people in the community, uh, his groups and others, to try to learn from the, how they kind of successfully, for instance, as I mentioned, uh, are able to negotiate you know, the right mandates, the, the, the right balance between flexibility and predictability. And that that is something that can be shared in this toolkit, for instance, under you know, negotiating a uh, open innovation project as kind of an activity with sub activities and techniques tied to it. Um, 
yeah so so that this is kind of a, an early basis for for a lot of uh, resources that we hope to be able to build together with the, the dhs uh, community of practitioners and, and users and uh, so on and we're particularly and that's also why i'm promoting this this uh, this uh, form that I, I shared the link for earlier or sending me an email uh, if you have again experiences with you know implementation projects focusing on users uh, both challenges and, and things that have worked well uh, so that we also might be able to share some of these experiences within this this toolkit thing uh, you know for instance under what are common challenges how do people overcome them how have people achieved you know successful you know uh ways of of innovating together with users co-designing uh, and so on and so i see there is also a question in the chat where can we access this toolkit glad to that someone are interested and asks so this is this is at this point it's a beta but we hope that in august we will be able to have something that we can actually uh, share uh, both for testing but also hopefully for use so uh, I'm happy also to to I will try to deposit it on the community of practice when that that time comes uh, and also Maria if you send me an email uh, maybe we can stay in touch and I can also share with you when it's it's uh, available for for testing. Yes, so that is the decided innovation toolkit. Um, moving to Another th resource that we have been working on a bit, this is also tied to, uh, because the design lab is tied to also a course at the University of Oslo, a big course with 100 students where they have a project where they develop DHS2 apps. Uh, so they have kind of a design and innovation project building apps for DHS2. Uh, and this, this is something that we also use in that course, this design and innovation toolkit resources, which we're also going to test in that course in their project in the fall. Obviously, a bit of an artificial kind of project configuration there as compared to real implementation projects. Uh, but in any way, very useful with, of course, methods and techniques for how do you analyze, you know, uh, the knowledge about users, how do you ideate, how do you prototype, and so on. Um, another uh, resource that we have been developing in relation to that course is a DHS2 web app development course, which is uh, available online, but which also is a beta version that we are this summer, we have several people working on, on improving the content of that course. And the hope is that over time, we want to develop it into a kind of full uh, self paced uh, DHS to web app uh, uh, learning resource for web app development, which we can use both, you know, in, in within the DHS to community, but also with our collaboration with universities in in other countries. Yeah, so what you see here from the screenshot is that you have, you know, learning kind of the whole stack of technologies that you need to learn and to be able to develop a DHS2 app. So while the core team provides a lot of, you know, useful uh, guides on, on, on how to do specific things with the DHS2 app development platform and the APIs, this takes you kind of from, you know, essential knowledge about front end web development to JavaScript to React, which is the kind of preferred a JavaScript framework for developing apps for DHS2, uh, and then you know to the to DHS2 uh, specific. How do you, how do you set up the environment for developing DHS2 apps? How do you communicate with the API and so on? So, and then there are some exercises. So in in our course at University of Oslo, the students there they use this to kind of get from not knowing potentially any front end development to be able to develop an app through a project with fellow students. Um, so again, also, if you have experiences with web app development or want to learn web app development, we will be very happy to talk to you on testing this resource and, 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 and seeing, you know, what, what could we do better or, or differently in terms of building capacity for DHS2 web app development. Yes, and finally, related to this issue that I mentioned in terms of how, you know, how, how, how much capacity and how much awareness are present in terms of how you structure implementation projects as agile agile or according to agile principles we also work on uh, or have a set of students working on principles guidelines and techniques for organizing agile dhs to implementation projects 
and hopefully these these resources are some some of the stuff that will feed into this design and innovation toolkit because agile is kind of quite closely connected to this you know flexible projects where you can innovate and uh, and design so yeah again if you have experiences with those type of aspects you know agile challenges opportunities successful stories of you know working agile in in a hisp group or in, in in implementation projects in general then it would be very valuable also to talk to on you know your experiences possibly you know documenting and feeding into the this uh, toolkit resource and through our further uh, research yes so rounding off i just want to say a bit about the future that we're what we're working on and what we're what we are seeing kind of in the future so our focus is kind of continuing on the understanding these practices and processes related to design and innovation within the the hs2 ecosystem and what type of resources that may you know enable and constrain uh, these uh, these practices uh, and as i said you know very very interested in talking to many of you on exploring the unsuccessful or successful you know ways of, of organizing things and and the challenges and opportunities related to 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 working with users and co-designing and so on uh, for instance just to mention last year we had uh, i had a session also on on this topic at the uh, conference and then we actually initiated contact with one one partner and an and, uh, implementation project and we now have master students participating in that project uh, trying to work on issues such as you know user involvement and and how do we frame the project to kind of maximize the potential for for useful innovations uh, and so on so please reach out if you uh, if you have as well also there were some mentionings in the chat which i thank you for i will i will then try to uh, contact you on that um yeah and then uh, as covid hopefully will be calming down at some point then we also hope to get back to more you know participation in projects in different countries um so for instance then using kind of app development projects as engines to try to explore how we can design and innovate on the hs2 learning both about methods and techniques and about uh, you know app development issues uh, opportunities with app development for the hs2 and we also have a lot of these interesting plans for collaboration with universities in Mozambique, Malawi and Tanzania, kind of exchanging master students and building capacity, not only with kind of uh, well educated and finished uh, students, but also and people working in groups, but also kind of working already with universities and building capacity on these kind of things uh, that can later feed into to our work in, in, in kind of the industry. So yeah, rounding off, just uh, again, urging you to, to, to either send me an email if you have any ex interesting experiences to share or, or some kind of proposal for collaboration or by scanning this barcode uh, and, and uh, filling out this very, very brief little uh, form, uh, including your email so we can, can stay in touch if you find any of these elements that we've been talking about uh, interesting. Thank you very much for uh, your attention and I hope it was interesting. <laughs>